Good morning, everyone, or at least good morning from Houston, Texas in the US. I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, broadcast and recording of the 2022 Switch Energy International Case Competition Final Judging Round. This competition is brought to you by the Switch Energy Alliance with additional support from SEMPRA and the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas in Austin. My name is Carl Stephenson, and I'm the Case Competition Project Manager. I'd like to introduce you to the Switch Energy Alliance team, several of whom are with us on the call today. First of all, we have our chairman and founder, Dr. Scott Tinker. Karina Smith is our executive director. Sarah Jane Todd is our manager of operations. Our senior fellow is Helga Halderson, and our curriculum and product lead is Megan Morgan, and our program associate is Aiden Chadwick. That this team, together with myself, have spent the last five months collaborating to bring this extraordinary opportunity for teams from around the world to come together and address the issue of energy poverty. The five finalists competing today are part of the 106 teams from 15 different countries that registered to compete this year. It's an impressive achievement to be one of these five finalist teams. The competition throughout the judging rounds was very intense and both judges and mentors have been extremely impressed by all of the proposals, but those that were submitted by these five teams were deemed to be the strongest. And now I'd like to introduce you to our esteemed panel of judges for the final round, Dr. Claudia J. Hackbarth, Joe Bob Edwards, and Gail Adams. Thank you to all of our judges for joining us today. Dr. Claudia J. Hackbarth received her BA in Environmental Sciences from the University of Virginia, and then went on to get her PhD in Geological Sciences from Harvard University. She had a long career with Royal Dutch Shell Petroleum, primarily focusing on upstream research, including deep water turbidites, new technologies, and unconventional resources. During her time at Shell, she led major shale gas exploration projects in the Hainesville Shale of the U.S. Gulf Coast and in the Sichuan Basin of China. She also spent several years on redevelopment and production maintenance for a number of old fields on the U.S. Gulf Coast. Dr. Hackbarth is currently the president-elect of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and next year she'll assume the presidency of that organization. She sits on two geoscience boards at the University of Texas at Austin, and she's been a supporter of the Switch Energy Alliance basically since its inception, and was instrumental in obtaining large grants and donations for SEA from Shell. Recently, she retired from Shell and is now working a few months per year as a cruise ship lecturer on earth science related topics. Joe Bob Edwards received his Bachelor of Admin Business Administration at the University of Texas at Austin. He spent 13 years as the head of the oil field service and equipment investment team at First Reserve Corporation. For the past 12 years, he's been a managing partner at White Deer Energy here in Houston. He is also co-chair of the KVH Energy Center for Business, Law, and Policy at the University of Texas in Austin, and currently sits on the boards of several private companies. Joe Bob is PATH president and board member of the Episcopal High School Dads Club, and has spent a number of years as a volunteer coach and board member of the Post Oak Little League. Gail Adams is our third judge. She received her BA in broadcast journalism from LSU. She has more than 20 years of experience in the environment and natural resources public policy arena and working with state and local governments. As Vice President of Communications and External Affairs for the Energeo Alliance, Gail works to accurately communicate the role of geoscience in the safe discovery, development, and delivery of both mainstay and alternative energy and low carbon solutions across the globe. She became involved in the energy industry while working on the Macondo oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico as the government affairs officer. Following a career at FEMA as the inter intergovernmental, apologies, following her career 
at FEMA as the Intergovernmental Affairs Di Director for Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Gustav, and Ike. Gail became the first Black Director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs for the U.S. Department of the Interior, serving under Secretaries Ken Salazar and Sally Jewell. Gail is the proud mother of two sons and three grandchildren and enjoys spending as much time with them as possible. Now on to the finals process. The judges have already reviewed the 10 minute videos and the PDFs that were initially submitted by the finalists. And now each team will have the opportunity to impress the judges and compete for a total prize package worth $25,000. Each team will begin their presentation with a three minute overview of their proposal, after which they'll be asked approximately three questions by the judges during a 10 minute Q&A session. After each team presentation, the judges will have two to three minutes to review their scoring. And then after all five teams have presented, we'll total the judges scores and announce the results. This will be the order of the presentations. First to present is Team 160, Polaris Consulting. You'll have three minutes to present your summary. So when you're ready, please share your screen and unmute. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can fix that. Thank you. There you go. Thanks. Um, I can't screen share while the other, oh, thank you. All right. Um, thank you all for joining us here. We are Polaris Consulting Group, and we will be presenting to you our 30 year plan for how Myanmar can improve electricity accessibility and cooking methods, sparking a better future. Here we can see Myanmar's current progress in electrification, which has been increasing steadily over the past two decades. However, there is presenting low rural accessibility due to high cost of rural electrification and low historical investment in the area. 66% of those living in Myanmar also cooked with biomass indoors, which has substantial negative health impacts. Before we move into our solutions to these problems, I wanted to highlight several challenges that make Myanmar uniquely difficult. Myanmar experienced a military coup in February 2021, resulting in widespread protests, armed combat, and heavy sanctions from the US and UN. Thanks, Jenny. Our primary short-term solution to energy poverty is partnering with the private sector through a company like Redavia to lease over 800 solar microgrids with battery storage, rapidly providing rural communities with electricity. Upfront investment in energy infrastructure is expensive and carries substantial risk for a country that's in a position as precarious as Myanmar's. By offloading some of that risk to the experienced private sector, Myanmar can save massive amounts of money. And by focusing on rural off-grid electrification, we can mitigate the risks associated with the civil war. Our long-term energy poverty solution involves investing over $150 million to improve and create hydroelectric dams and large-scale solar farms allowing Myanmar to utilize its abundant natural energy sources and capitalize on the continually declining price of solar. This will allow Myanmar to develop reliable and domestic sources of electricity. Similarly to our solution for energy, our solution for improving cooking infrastructure is twofold. In the short term, we're providing those living in Myanmar who cook indoors using firewood or other biomass with clean cooker stoves that reduce emissions by 43%, dramatically reducing exposure to harmful gases and requiring no training to use. In the long term, we plan to invest in solar cookers, allowing the technology to catch up and become feasible for rural populations. We then plan to purchase enough to provide one for every community currently relying on biomass to cook. To fund all of these operations, we plan on utilizing existing partnerships with public and private Chinese equity groups that have invested heavily in Myanmar's infrastructure projects in the past. These loans will be paid off with the cash flow from future completed projects. We anticipate a rural electrification rate of 90% a 75% decrease in the use of toxic cooking devices and massive improvements in substantial uh, in sustainability and quality of life by 2052. A two-pronged approach combining short and long-term solutions may be unconventional, 
but we fundamentally believe that access to electricity and better cooking is transformative. The benefits of higher educational attainment, greater economic growth, and better health outcomes compound on one another, which is why our approach emphasizes creating access as soon as possible. The downstream exponential social and economic benefits of providing electricity today rather than tomorrow are simply too great to pass up. Okay, very good. Your three minutes are up. Uh, we can move into the Q&A session. And uh, Dr. Hackbarth, do you have any questions for the team? Yes, indeed. And thank you so much. I really enjoyed your, um, your preparation and your delivery. Um, the, some of the things I wanted to comment on first is I really liked your clever solution of delivering large stoves and encouraging communal cooking, and then how you tested that against um, community norms and cultural norms. I thought that was very cool. And I also thought it was interesting to re do long-term research in solar cookers. So allocating money towards research, I thought was also very far thinking. So I congratulate you on that. My question is about business risk about the, uh, the initial um, solar energy um, solution you suggested with Redavia, for example. And that is that you made um, you know, quite a bit of reference to the coup and all the, uh, the disruption and terrible economic and human toll that it's taking. So have you thought any more about the business risk that is Redavia would be you know, putting a whole bunch of money up front you know, uh, in your model what would induce them to do that under such heavy business risk? Yeah, and that's a very fair question. And so when we were trying to address this idea of short-term energy, we really wanted to think about first, should it be the Myanmar government or a private company? And what we came to realize is for the Myanmar government, not only is there a capital risk, but there's also a huge like question of there's just not enough like trained technicians or education enough for this kind of project. And now when we look from the perspective of Redavia, uh, it's not completely unheard of for companies to take risky investments. Sometimes the potential profit is great. And here, if we're really planning, it's over, it's a 10-year contract worth over 300 million, almost 400 million for this private corporation. And it's signed for 10 years. 10 years guaranteed, not one by one. And so that kind of guaranteed capital flow is very attractive to a company and they're likely to uh, be very, uh, to be more interested in uh, taking that risk um, than uh, usual. So the other part that we, uh, sorry, just to add on to that it, is that solar panels last a long time, uh, especially with a company like Redavia that already has a lot of solar panels. You know, these solar panels can last 30, 40 years, if not longer and maintain really high photovoltaic outfit, out, output. Um, and we're only using them for 10 years. We're using them for a really short portion of that period. Um, so we basically are we'll view it as an attractive investment for both parties. Um, where Davia gets the benefit of a large amount of uh, money and uh, from leasing it to Myanmar um, and doesn't have to part with any of these solar panels in the long term. So sorry, your solution then is that the government guarantees the payback. Thank you. Okay, Joe, Bob, do you have any questions for the team? Absolutely, yeah, good, good morning, everyone. And thank you guys for such an amazing job. I, my, my question really is uh, uh, around the uh, sort of the, the long-term bet on a technology for for a cooking stove that might not be commercially viable yet. And the, uh, the choice of going that route with an intermediate step around the communal cooking as Dr. Hackbarth mentioned. Um, but I'm curious, as you, as you looked at LPG as an alternative in the, in the infrastructure required for LPG uh, distribution within the country, um, did you think at all about the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative as a potential uh, funding source. You, you, you do a great job of identifying China as a as a partner within Myanmar today, um, and the various uh, various Chinese funding sources for this you know longer term infrastructure development uh, program. But specifically around LPG, did you did you look at all around uh, the cost benefit analysis of LPG, uh, not only as a short term or, or intermediate term solution, but as a longer term. Uh, but perhaps cheaper and, and more certain solution for the cooking fuel issues. Sure, I can take that. Uh, we, we did look into LPG um, and particularly 
particularly through partnering with China. Um, the main reason that we were sort of dissuaded from following that kind of route um, was just the current state of highways and railway uh, in Myanmar. Over 60% of uh, highways and railways are in poor condition and the existing network really isn't that extensive, particularly, particularly in terms of getting resources to rural populations. Um, so what we eventually came, the conclusion we eventually came to was that the investment in infrastructure required to reliably develop or reliably deliver LPG to these rural communities was too high. And we realized that we were spending such a substantial amount on just developing the infrastructure to get the energy to them that we didn't have enough money left over for the actual energy itself. Um, and I think that that sort of consequence was what pushed us away from that. Situation. Yeah. And built. And building on that, uh, LPG requires specialized tanks to hold them because they're highly inflammable, highly combustible. Um, if we're that might be more reasonable for a city setting where we can have large tanks, but to do one in each rural village that is relatively scattered, that's very uh, inefficient. Uh, like your energy, the cost of that infrastructure per like that people served is not going to be very high. Um, on the other hand, to address your question about the technology being commercial, commercialized or ready for commercial. Um, right now, there's already prototypes that work uh, in Nigeria, and they it's a parabolic cooking structure with a, a little energy saving box that so they can save extra rays. Um, and it's really cheap. It's made of plywood, iron pipes, aluminum sheets. And right now, they're mainly just testing to make additional efficiency modifications. And this is a research project we found immediately. And so we think just like looking at these kind of projects and investing in them, who have already shown great potential, really decreases that likelihood of the product not being commercialized within 10 years. Excellent. Well, terrific job, guys. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Gail, do you have any questions for the team? No, I don't. I'm walking in the airport, so <laughs> I'm gonna be a little <laughs> quiet for right now. All right, well, thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes uh, remaining. Are there any more questions from either of the other judges? Okay, let's, uh, thanks Team Polaris. If you'll uh, unshare your screen and we can give the floor to Team 102, the AFC Legends. So please unmute and share your screen. Hello everyone, we are AFC Legends from Colombia and we are very excited to be here. So our challenge was to improve energy access and reliability in Colombia for 30 years. Our solution is based on energy generation, infrastructure improvements, education, and our impacts. Almost 1 million people from communities in the rural, rural areas will have access to energy with diversified solutions for all regions. Colombia's population distribu is distributed in rural and urban areas. 96% of the population have access to electricity divided up on off-grid and on-grid Zones uh, and Colombia is heavily dependent on fossil fuels. Some key challenges for the interconnected system are the hydro dependence, energy monopoly, energy inefficiencies in the final consumption, and bad service quality. For the OBRID, we have challenges like digital dependency, low service quality, lack of professionals and technicians, and cooking with time. With Our implementation is based in three pillars energy generation, education, and infrastructure improvements. For the energy generation solution, we are taking advantage of all the renewable sources, wind, biogas, solar, and hydro uh, for the on grid. And for the on grid, we are taking only solar PV. We are generating in the borders of the system in order to reinforce the on grid and to integrate on grid communities to the on grid too. To improve the infrastructure, we want to connect more areas to the grid, do maintenance and a technology jump in the North Coast export energy to our neighbor countries and co-finance efficient machinery for the industry. For education, we focus on nuclear and hydrogen energy generation research, the owning support and training for local communities, replacement of unclean fuel soaps and scholarships. An overview of the plan, we will have three phases, each one of 10 years, $400 million per phase, $1.2 billion for the 30 years, 
90% of the budget goes to the phases, 10% for unexpected events. We are staying within the allocated budget. Some impacts in data uh, are rural areas with access to electricity, dollars spent for every person in the off-grid zones, cost per unit of energy, and total installed capacity for 2050. We are impacting also some SDGs like quality education coverage rate, reduction of total greenhouse emissions, and others. To conclude, we need to reinforce what we have. We need to improve the interconnected system. Also, we need to aim to new technologies to leverage the potential of each region with diversified solutions and that the education is a must. We need to develop local talent and research on energy. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thank you very much, team. That was uh, very good. Um, Joe Bob, would you like to lead off with some questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Guys, I, I really enjoyed your presentation, particularly given the pride that you clearly show around your home country of Colombia and improving um, a system that has been in place long before you were born and will hopefully improve uh, over your lifetime and beyond. So, so uh, on, congratulations uh, on, a, on a terrific analysis. Um, I, I have a, a, a few questions mainly around um, what I think you correctly highlight, uh, which is what I describe as an all of the above strategy, right? You, you've got an existing on-grid system that leverages a combination of thermal and renewable sources, and you clearly want to uh, invest in, in education of your population to, uh, to, to move into more renewable sources such as solar, um, et cetera. Um, my, my, my question around uh, the, the the choice of nuclear and hydrogen as as the place where you would like to invest most of your uh, your, your sort of longer term uh, research dollars. Um, what what drives you in the in that direction as a potential solution for the, the the challenges that we have? You know, less energy poverty, less CO2 footprint. What what specifically around nuclear and hydrogen within Colombia uh, pushes you in that direction versus others? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, we took into account uh, new energies. Right now, Colombia is researching in hydrogen, for example. Uh, some universities are doing combination of diesel hydrogen trucks. So we believe that if we develop the local talent, maybe in 5, 10, 15 years, we, have, we can have a, a, a lot of talent to produce our own companies, to make our own supply of energies and, uh, and to not be dependent uh, of importing those energies. And I want to add that Colombia have a lot of potential in, in hydrogen generation because of the, a lot of water we have uh, here in Colombia. So we, need, we, we think that in Colombia, we have a lot of potential in, in hydrogen. And did you did you research at all the availability of the feedstocks or the raw materials required to produce hydrogen and the and the complexities around and the potential trade-offs around making hydrogen from a variety of of, of, of sources? Yeah, uh, we we search and, and we understand that the generation of, of the energy with hydrogen uh, for that we need uh, like energy and also a source of energy to like to do the, I don't know, like the, the generation, yes. Yeah. So uh, we, we know that Colombia have a lot of potential in that, in that, in that part, but uh, we know that the technology at this moment in Colombia is like not re ready to do the, the generation right now. So because of that, we are doing the investigation in that energy. Especially for especially for nuclear energy, for example, that uh, we have to be more um, conscious and uh, yeah, we, we, we have to be more careful about how we implement it because of the risks that they have. Yeah, the thing is that we know we are a, a country in development. We know that uh, to research in those energies is gonna be tough, but if you start right now, uh, we can have in, uh, in a span of years, we can have a local talent to compete with the uh, most developed countries. We believe in the in the people from from our country. Well, the good news is Colombia is not alone in recognizing that hydrogen technology is not quite there yet. <laughs> it's 
it's not uh, it, it's not there yet anywhere. So, uh, but but it, we're we're all very hopeful that it gets there. Thank you guys again. Great job. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Claudia, any questions? Yes. Then I wanted to say how much I enjoyed your presentation, your materials, and what I especially liked is I think you started with grids that were already existing of crucial factors for energy, along with indicators but then you transform those into solution grid matrices where you ranked your solutions against those factors. Is that correct? That was your work? Yeah, yeah. I really I really like that. That was succinct and useful. Um, my two questions are around the money, the overall funding. And you said that the entire, I think I, you were saying the entire 1.2 billion is borrowed uh, in three increments. So the first question is, um, you know, if the government uh, is I guess that's the government who's the borrower, but they can pay each increment back in 10 years. What would be the reason that they would be borrowing it all as opposed to pay as you go by themselves? Well, uh, we first believe that the projects uh, can generate the money uh, to pay themselves. So every 10 years, we have the period of grace to pay the loans uh, of that year. So when one phase and we, we are going to start paying the debt. So by 2063, all the loans are going to be paid. And we do not want to be uh, dependent on the government budget. So we are borrowing it. Uh, we are aware that the Colombian government has a, uh, a big budget for energy production. Uh, but we know, for example, that um, we have on other energy sources like the fossil fuels, uh, petroleum, natural gas that we are heavily dependent on, uh, and we cannot cut them loose. So that government budget goes to that, and the loans uh, are going to be paid uh, within within themselves with the production that uh, we are going to generate. Okay, so the payback goes to 2063. And then my other question about the loans is that. What do you think the lenders are going to think about the host government putting none of its own money in? You know, why would they lend the money if the host government isn't confident enough to have some skin in the game? Okay, I think that I have that answer, and that is because uh, Colombia at this moment have like a polit the laws and the the political I thinking is to go to a transition in energy. So I think the the banks. Uh, will have the confidence to to lend the money for for do that and I think all the world in, at this moment and the development banks are interested in in, in invest in projects like this. Also, uh, Colombia has history. We have been uh, developing with a um, stable rate uh, for more than twenty years. We we have good uh, relationships with these banks, the World Bank the Inter-American Development Bank and the Latin, Latin American Caribbean uh, Development Bank. So we know that a project in green energies for the transition is it, gonna be, uh, it's gonna generate interest uh, in those banks to develop our country. Thank you, good job. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, Gail, do you have any questions for uh, AFC Legends? Actually, the, the question was asked, I was going to ask about um, the government and their share of investing in, in, the, um, in the energy system, but it was asked, so thank you. Okay, great. Um, we have uh, just a couple of minutes left. Do either of the other judges have any follow-up questions? Okay. Let's uh, turn the floor over then to team 186, the Catalyst. Uh, I cannot share the screen right now. Oh. Yeah, I, I So is my screen visible? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so hello everyone. We are Team The Catalyst from India. 
our country of choice was Ghana, which has a population of around 31 million and electricity access of 84.7%. The factors behind the energy poverty of Ghana is, are, uh, revolves around four central issues, which was affordability, clean fuel, air pollution, and power crisis, starting with the problems. Dumpser is the regular power outage, which has a grave impact on the financial security of the nation. As a matter of fact, government of Ghana loses almost 500 million US dollars because of the overproduction, uh, which, uh, which shows the impacts on the shutdowns of multiple uh, industries too. Around 77% of the people uses firewood and charcoal as their cooking fuel, which leads to multiple respiratory diseases. The state of economic underdevelopment has also some grave effects on the healthcare facilities, which includes lack of clean water, refrigeration facilities for drugs, constant power cuts that deprives the patients from their needful treatment. So among the solutions that we intend to propose, one of the solutions is uh, formation of national data repository system that shall help fight the uh, political misconduct in the country. Simply put, it will be an online directory documenting data across the energy sector that shall be used for analyzing future opportunities and risks. Second is the on-grid expansion plan model for 79 unelectrified rural communities, which has cost 17.2 million US dollars. Our next solution is implementation of solar at three scales, community and household scale, and implementation at uh, installation at healthcare facilities that, uh, according to our plan, will bring clean energy to 555,000 households, and there will be uh, increase of 25% uh, in electricity access time. Similarly, biogas implementation in Ghana solves all the triaged problem of clean cooking fuel, sa sanitation, and deforestation. Our plan will uh, target 7 million households, uh, we, and the funds will be generated through public private partnership. So around 77% of Ghanaian farmers are involved in the production of cassava, whose waste can be used to produce eat and blend fuel. It will also save an annual of 71 million US dollars and can also generate additional income for the farmers. The plan we proposed is in conjugation with 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, generating community benefits across a broader spectrum. It ranges from employment generation to better healthcare facilities. Uh, from clean environment to opportunity to upskill, from hygiene and sanitation to passive income for farmers. The overall cost for our proposal is 891.53 million US dollars. In the end, we are really thankful to Switch Energy Alliance for the exhilarating experience and special thanks to all the panelists and especially our mentor, Mr. Chris Torre, for its support throughout. Looking forward to answering all your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Team 186. Uh, Gail, we can start with you if you have any questions. I do. I have just one one central question. I know you said that um, you all, and, but thank you and congratulations to making it to this round. Um, in terms of, of solar, how how are you meaning to deploy that specifically for communities? So, uh, in uh, other the community scale solar plan is basically for. Uh, uh, the is basically a plan in which government will uh, invest the money and will uh, uh, the centers will be uh, and the centers will uh, and it it will be free of cost uh, the so the community scale solar will basically uh, provide solar energy to the people to make them uh, to, to to make them to uh, so that they can also uh, 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 find the benefits of the solar energy uh, and uh, in the initial years and then our uh, off-grid solar plan is implemented in which we are charging them a, a particular sum amount of money for the solar. In addition to that, this community Thank you. Will, uh, in addition to that, this community solar will act as a survey for us uh, in initial years whose data will be, we will be using for uh, establishing the off-grid solar for the households. Yeah. And we will do it through the uh, national depository that we have created. Thank you. Okay, Claudia, any questions? Yes. Yeah, so thank you for the excellent job. I really yes. liked. Um, I really liked the uh, 
point about capturing the data, both as an extremely valuable asset for improvement going forward, and also as an anti-corruption device. That, that was really clever that you thought of that. And I also really appreciated that healthcare improvements were an integral part of your plan, fully, fully in there as a basis of your um, decisions. So that was just really wonderful. So um, I have a question each about uh, biogas and about electricity. So I noticed you said that due to climate change, that there could potentially be some very serious um, impacts on agricultural productivity, including perhaps a precipitous drop in uh, cassava production, yet your investment into biogas reactors is depending on uh, on cassava waste. So did you think about um, the upfront investment of biogas uh, installations depending on a crop that you know it might be iffy in the future? Uh, thank you so much to your panelists for your question. Uh, now I'd like to point out that our biogas plant is running on the waste generated from the cassava production. That is because of this uneven distribution of rainfall and the climate change. Cassava gets wasted a whole lot. A 40 to 50% of the entire production gets wasted. We have implemented, we have found a solution from this problem. We are finding the solution of biogas using the cassava waste that is being generated. So here you can also see that how much of waste is being generated and we'll be using 30% of the waste in order to offset 9.6%. So it's not like we are using the direct cassava which is produced, but the waste which is generated out of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But if the total cassava crop fails in the ground, there might be less waste in the future. Right, right, right. I agree. I agree to the point. But the thing is, for biofuel production, when you use cassava, right? So the waste the, that we have considered in here is because of the storage problems. It's not if if it hasn't been produced because Ghana is the second largest producer in the world of cassava, right? So the waste, uh, the waste is generated because of the storage facilities, because of the problem of storage facilities. Because cassava has a shell life of only two days. If you don't store it properly within two days, or if you don't export it, or you don't use it, it will start to rot. So uh, yeah. that was the problem we tried to cater using and, this solution. And ma'am, in addition to cassava plant, we can also there is a prospect of using cocoa husk for the production of biofuel also. We can use that also if, uh, yeah. if presently that is in pilot. So we haven't uh, uh, allotted budget for that, but uh, there is, there are multiple pilot projects going on and there is significant improvement. So we can also use cocoa husk as Ghana is second largest uh, cocoa production in Africa. Okay. That's a great answer. And also, you know, human and animal waste and, you know, other sources that could go into the reactors. Um, my second question is about the electricity overproduction. That's pretty amazing, even though it's very intermittent, you know, the fact that there's at least periodically huge amounts of overproduction, that's pretty, pretty, maybe a good problem to have. So I was thinking about that also relevant to your statement that there's terrible air pollution in Ghana. I was wondering if you ever thought about connecting um, the overproduction of electricity and the air pollution. So for example, looking at electrification of transportation, um, perhaps setting up uh, electrical fuel yeah. with battery storage. Yes, yes, we have thought of that. Like, uh, uh, as we are going to introduce the whole concept of solar to them with, with the uh, community scale. So if after when the household level will start, then the uh, then the future use of community will be which which can be charging of EVs. So there is a prospect that we can. Uh, so we are basically uh, uh, plan to set up twenty thousand community centers. So uh, in future there can be a, a network of twenty thousand EV charging or something related to. Uh, so that electricity can go into different purposes like as you suggested air uh, air cleaning uh, uh, machines or something like that. So that energy can be uh, channeled into multiple purposes as the uh, uh, as the needs generate. And in addition to that, the household solar that we are implementing, uh, the capacity of that solar is higher than its consumption. So if, it, if over time, if community is not using that, that amount of energy, then that extra energy can be uh, can be uh, like uh, put onto the onto the grid, and that can be connected to the community center, and from where the EVs, the batteries can be charged, and we can introduce it to the uh, transportation sector, resulting in clean air. How about it, the urban areas that have on-grid right now with the massive overproduction? 
Uh, so if we talk about the urban sector, so uh, the overproduction and the losses are happening because of the poor infrastructure uh, at, at that urban areas. So for that, uh, the government, if we can see in the current map, so at the lower uh, at the lower section, there is like a heavy amount of transmission line, which is which is fully connecting all the all the uh, regions. So at present, there are multiple investment uh, in this infrastructure for improving it and for decreasing its technical losses. And if the technical losses is decreased, the affordability for this, uh, uh, this will increase. increase uh, the electricity will increase. And if this uh, uh, for the overproduction that we are generating in the urban areas, uh, a part of it will be used for the pe people who can afford it, and uh, that additional people will be added to it. And that overproduction, we have like suggested four points for uh, like uh, countering it. Uh, that is, uh, if you can go to the like overproduction. Yeah. Overproduction slide, yeah. So yes. we have select, uh, like, we have suggested the four. Uh, for solution to that, that is creating the industrial hub near the overproduction centers and exporting the uh, exporting the extra generated uh, generated electricity to the near uh, near countries of the Ghana and existing there are existing investment in this field like. Uh, like there are th like there is three zero three hundred million dollars has been invested by U.S. government. Uh, of to improve the energy infrastructure as well as Ghana has also taken loan from African Development Bank to improve the uh, in uh, infrastructure of the existing national grid. Okay, I'd like to give um, Joe Bob an opportunity to ask a question if he has any. Yeah, you bet. Uh, thank you, guys. Great, great presentation. Um, just, just real quick, thinking about Ghana. As, as as a as a productive uh, producer of of energy from all sort sources, you guys have I think correctly identified the solar potential that Ghana has and have a strategy there. Uh, you've also identified I think a very unique uh, and and clever uh, fuel source from waste crops. I think that's great. And you also mentioned that their hydro resource is is what they've historically relied upon. Uh, and and uh, but the, the challenges around you know uh, climate change as it, as it relates to water coming from from Burkina Faso. So well done identifying all those potential benefits and potential shortfalls. My question really is around the the the, the cooking fuel, and and also the um, as as it relates to the natural resource that Ghana has offshore. They're blessed with phenomenal oil and gas reserves um, in uh, in their offshore regions. Uh, my, my question is, did you look at uh, using natural gas production as a way or LPG production as a way to potentially eliminate wood and charcoal usage for as a cooking fuel as an alternative to only relying upon biogas? Again, thinking about an all of the above strategy and using all of the energy sources that the country has, did you did you think about fossil fuels at all in your in your evaluation? Yes, we did look at that. In fact, uh, uh, the main problem around it was the over dependency of uh, the source of natural gas to the Ghana on West African gas pipeline. So according to multiple reports, reports as i would like to cite an example in 2013 there was a uh, uh, infrastructural damage to the pipeline which led to around shortage of uh, 30 to 50 million standard cubic uh, cubic feet of gas which was planned to be 123 so so because there is this one uh, major pipeline that uh, on which around 60% of uh, thermal power gener generation station depends in ghana so it creates a problem around it uh, that's why we haven't considered uh, to completely offsetting the uh, clean cooking fuel demands with the uh, with the offshore assets. Uh, besides, I would like to add a point that uh, uh, the, Ghana, the Ghanaian government under the Ministry of Petroleum, they're already running a program called the Rural Liquefied Petroleum Gas Distribution Program, under which they have distributed 60,000 free cooking gas stoves and cylinders of LPG cylinders until 2013. So that, that project is already in implementation in the country. So we wanted to uh, find out a solution which is more localized, more cheaper, and more sustainable for, uh, for the future because, because the raw material is easily available. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll have to move on now. I'd like to uh, ask Team 194, Urja Briti, to share their screen and start their presentation.
I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Okay. So we would like to start our presentation. Any investment made in sustainable energy is investing in the nation's development. Working on the lines of switch, we team Urja Vriddhi from India tried to work on the case of Ghana for this edition of the competition. Located in Western Africa, has, uh, Ghana has a population of roughly around 32 million with a GDP per capita of around $2450. The current energy mix involves a huge share of hydropower and some usage of hydrocarbon along with little share from renewables. Ghana has huge untapped potential for renewable for electricity generation. The major generation occurs in the southern part, leaving the north scarce. The 80% of the nation's wealth resides with the top 20% richest population. Thus, the problems can be discussed as dependency on fuels with higher emissions, huge poverty rates, and lack of technical knowledge, skills, and motivations in the people. Challenges to the current Ghanaian energy mix could be understood as weak and unstable economy, lack of skilled population, over dependency on hydropower, and post COVID effects. Energy opportunities could be well surged in solar, thermal, geothermal, and others. To combat the future energy challenge and current energy challenge, we came up with the solution of the hybrid future. The hybrid renewable energy system in the solution proposal consists of 100% renewable with a combination of solar and biogas with both on and off grids. The initial stage of data collection through a pilot test focuses on the city of Menkaramso and considers the challenges of poor energy distribution and access. We studied the annual electricity demand and the performance of our solution considering the technical, economic, and environmental aspects comparing three different combinations of energy. From the analysis, we determined the renewable fractions and the carbon dioxide emissions. The solution proposed using the hybrid system of solar and biogas has a renewable fraction of 100% and a low emission rate aligning with the grounds of Paris Agreement. The sensitivity analysis includes the impact of subsidization and discounted rate distribution, thereby providing a promising solution for energy access to oil. The project plans on establishing 1777 mini hybrid plants under the allocated budget distributed region wise on the basis of current energy. The phase one involves setting up nodes across all the regions up to the year 2030, distributing more plants in energy poor region by 2040, and completing the network of proposed system by 2050. The financing for the project can be backed by both the private and the public sectors, as well as from national and international banks. The solution would help achieve cleaner cooking fuel and better health condition. Concluding, the project aims in 96% electrification of Ghana by 2050, eradicating energy poverty, thereby boosting the social, technical, and economic development of the Ghanaians. And as our team tries to resonate that, if you have an idea, switch it on. We thank the organizers for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Well done. Um, let's start out with Joe Bob. Do you have any questions for the team? Yeah, great job. I love the branding of the hybrid future. I think that's uh, I think that's a particularly good touch. Um, and I also want to commend you for doing what looks to be an incredible amount of work on a pilot project, um, and and thinking about taking a small step first just to prove the concept, and then rolling it before rolling it out countrywide. So. So a terrific job. My, my question is, is really on the, 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 the source of biogas and the identification of biogas as the sole source of your, of your conventional uh, energy uh, production on this uh, hybrid future energy system. How, what, how did you arrive at biogas? Did you, did you do work on the trade-offs between biogas and conventional forms of energy? And, and when what pushed you in that direction as opposed to uh, to 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 a different fuel source? Uh, for the biogas, uh, what uh, what puts uh, forward our solution is that uh, it, uh, Ghana is a very agriculture uh, proven country, and the most of the population is uh, in the north where where the their cattle. Uh, so the animal waste is one such prospect that puts forward uh, the uh, formation of biogas and the agriculture products. For the uh, biogas, uh, what we are doing is that. Uh, uh, we have planned or we have suggested a method wherein the uh, uh, government would be putting forward some uh, 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 some vehicles which would which will uh, which would collect the 
uh, agricultural waste and the uh, animal waste from the small villages and uh, we will we would be collecting uh, uh, these uh, these waste from from different villages and would be making a central facility for the uh, animal waste and the uh, agriculture waste making a central facility for the production of the biogas so what will what this will do is that it will also uh, give the people who are giving their animal waste with the, with their cattle an income source because we would be giving them money for their uh, amount of animal animal waste they are providing uh, so this is uh, what we have planned in uh, for the biogas and uh, we have uh, done uh, we have put the uh, expenditure in the in the appendix section for that. Great, thank you, guys. Well done. Also, also adding on to this, uh, we had done we had compared three system of energy as can be seen on the slide. Uh, just a second, the slide is rotating. Yeah, so we have uh, considered the three system of energy, which involves the uh, solar PV and biogas. Another system involves the solar as well as diesel, and the third system involves the diesel. So we considered the biogas system and we uh, showed from an analysis that the biogas and the PV system has a good amount of renewable fraction with lower carbon emissions. And this type, uh, this uh, system has a good uh, battery capacity as well. And the total electricity production uh, is good considering the renewable only fractions. Uh, if we go for the diesel, it's uh, comparatively larger for the diesel production, but it's uh, comparatively not with that renewable fraction. So for the P solar and biogas uh, consideration, we considered it and it showed us the very good effect with less uh, carbon emissions and good number of renewable fractions. Yeah, that was a point behind choosing the solar and biogas hybrid. Okay, thank you, Gail. Do you have any questions for the team? I do. Um... In terms of your project, which um, SDGs in your estimation um, will is your project addressing the sustainable development goals? So uh, our sustainable development goals, the, talking about the sustainable development goals, our project analyzes the uh, education for all, health and safety, as well as our, uh, the energy for all. And uh, different, including all the, uh, they have some aspects of uh, all 17, I, we should say cleaner energy, sustainable development, uh, energy for energy distribution to all and everyone. And that's, that's, uh, that's how we uh, came out to the fact that this uh, energy combination is not only renewable, but sustainable as well. So those, uh, the carbon emissions of this project, uh, as we discussed for the solar and biogas has a very uh, low rate of uh, emission. So this is very environmental friendly. And so addressing all the aspects of uh, sustainable development goals, uh, saying the cleaner energy education for better health system, better education system, sustainable development, better water, better cooking conditions, you know. So we have uh, addressed them carefully. Yeah. Thank you, great job. Thank you so much. Hey, and Claudia, any questions? Uh, yes, and congratulations on the wonderful work that you've done. I especially liked the way that your economic, well, it was very impressive economic analysis. And I like the way that it went from the small modeling and then scaling up and then looking at sensitivity studies on macro factors. So very good job there. Um, my question is about the hybrid system itself. Um, I guess it's, is it a standard design of solar PV, biogas and battery storage that you would then just replicate and stamp out the same everywhere? Or is it tuned to different places? And then what would be the, the positives and the negatives of having a standard design that you could replicate easily versus tuning it to different places? Oh, thank, thank you so you. much for, for asking this. Uh, so we have seen the recent development of renewables and we have seen the uh, development of solar in across the world. Several countries have utilized solar uh, as their primary energy development sources as well nowadays. And we have also seen the development of biogas as well. At this stage, we have considered the same uh, development facilities and infrastructure as the other countries have implied for the project. So we'll be utilizing those for our phase one development. So for the phase one, we have uh, thought about establishing the power plants in the nodes. As we discussed in the pre uh, previous slides that uh, the Ghana is not very energy distributed, right? So the southern part has a huge, huge amount of distribution and the northern part is very energy scarce. So it's a very uh, prominent solution to uh, optimize and give the nodes to the energy scarce region. 
So for the first phase one projects, we are planning on to establish nodes across the Ghana so that these nodes can uh, work as a nodal centers for development all across, all around them to uh, supply and dis to generate a more di distribution effective and cost effective systems. So, and phase two will uh, try to work around these nodes in the energy scarce parts. And for the phase three, we'll be implementing all full-time 1,777 plants, which have been planned under the allocated budget in this uh, uh, study. So we are uh, plan We have planned it phase-wise. First phase would be ending in year 2030, then in 2040, then in 2050. That would give us a uh, high amount of time, ample amount of time to apply at the later stages if we have any new energy to develop or if we have any new progress in our traditional energy systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, adding to that, uh, I would also like to say that uh, our solution is uh, not just uh, made for a common terrain. Uh, Ghana is uh, different. Uh, Ghana has different terrain, so our, uh, our it is a combination of the solar and the biogas. So we are uh, not uh, so our uh, product pro uh, project is isolated. It can act as an isolated source. So for example, if if a uh, if a village is located on a high terrain, so if there is so uh, there is established the, the establishment of solar and the biogas generated in that village can act as a energy source for that village, and we do not have to refrain to the uh, terrain differences in the country. So that is a big uh, pro big advantage uh, for the project. Thank you. And my just a small question would be, I think you have the cost uh, per plant of half a million dollars each. Just curious if such a hybrid has been built anywhere and if that where that cost estimate came from, just quickly. Yeah, so I think there was a study we referred to and there was a study from India which utilizes similar type of uh, hybrid uh, energy system, including the uh, biogas, and but uh, it was not uh, revolving around the solar, but it involved the biogas as well as thermal productions. So we uh, optimized that for our study and uh, looked at that the project cost, the initialization, initialization, the pilot test and stuff, and then we decided to procure it, and then we went with, ahead with the solar as we saw that Ghana has a huge, immense amount of potential for solar, and that would give a huge hybrid uh, and good hybrid solution and a good renewable source for our energy system. So that energy, uh, that uh, reference from Indian uh, little pilot test had been a major like uh, idea for behind this uh, hybrid project, yeah. Thank you. Okay, very well. Thank you, guys. Um, now I'd like to move on to our final team, Team 148, Nimbus 2.0. Um, yeah, so can you see my screen? Yes. All right, I'll start. Welcome to our case study on Ghana's energy poverty. Ghana is a developing nation with two major energy poverty issues. The first issue is the lack of clean cooking fuel access where 78% of Ghana's household use biomass. This leads to 18,000 deaths each year from respiratory illness. The second issue is the lack of reliable electricity supply, which also happens to be quite expensive compared to many developed nations. Now let us look at how we can solve these issues. To solve Ghana's energy problems, we have bifurcated our solution methodology into four sections. In the first two sections, we talk about solutions to the cooking fuel crisis and the electricity crisis, while in the third and fourth section, we talk about the financial model. So coming to our solution on clean cooking fuel access. At the moment, only 22% of Ghana's population use LPG, which mandates or gives biogas was observed to be the most appropriate solution. Based on the various raw materials and their availability over the next 30 years for biogas generation, we propose a timeline for biogas installation. We predict that by 2050, the combination of LPG and biogas can cater up to 95% of Ghana's population. We also also presented our supply chain by various organizations overcoming the unreliable electricity supply in Ghana. We analyzed three renewable sources available in Ghana and solar PV with battery storage was found to be the most appropriate solution. And based on Ghana's future power, future power demand, we proposed a timeline for solar PV installation. The supply chain analysis for our PV model was also conducted and is shown in the slide. Now coming to our financial model for, for our projects. 
for biogas, we propose a strategy where we invest money in the first phase for building capacity, then recoup this amount, and again reinvest this money in the next phase to build more biogas plants. With this methodology, we can build a total and annual capacity of 16 million meter cube by 2050 at an expense of $280 million. Similar strategy can be used for building solar PV capacity, and we can have a 75 gigawatt installation by 2050 at an expense of $130 million. The final bifurcation of our financial model is not shown in the slide, and it is found to be well within the budget allocated to us. Finally, we propose an innovative method for additional revenue generation, which is by using carbon credits. The carbon credit market is expected to grow by 100 times by 2050, and if Ghana opts for the solution that we have proposed, it will earn credits worth billions of dollars. This revenue generated by selling credits can be used for various welfare schemes. At last, we discuss upon the impact our solutions will have on Ghana society and environment, and we find that our solutions impact at least 10 sustainable development goals, and that is all from our side. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, team. Um, can open up the questions with Gail, if you have anything for the team. I, 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 this is more of a comment than a question. Um, great job. And I really, really like how you leveraged um, your investments with utilization of the carbon credits. And I um, love the recycling component. So really great job. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Claudia, any questions? Yes, and I also want to commend the, the clever, diabolically clever idea of monetizing carbon credits. That was brilliant. And I also liked your extra strong um, link back to the UN sustainable, uh, sustainable Development Goals. That was just really good. Um, one question I have is about sourcing um, the biogas material from urban areas. Uh, I understand that a tiny fraction of um, Ghanaians are hooked up to sewer systems, like less than 3%. And yet in the urban areas, the idea is to collect that and put it into the bioreactors. And you do mention like major pipelines leading to, but then I started wondering about if you've thought about going upstream of the main pipelines, you know, how do you, uh, did you take into account the cost and the time of going further upstream and collecting it, you know, from blocks or, you know, in these urban areas, because that doesn't apparently doesn't currently exist. Yeah, so uh, actually in the urban areas where the population density is substantially higher, it's better that we have a upstream collection of the uh, human waste, uh, which is through the sewer system, so that we can have a bigger biogas plants uh, installation at a single, at a single location. So uh, that is how we would approach the problem, if I understand your question correctly. And uh, um, maybe, maybe, maybe my uh, teammate Rupmati would also add on to that. Yes, so uh, I'd like to mention that biogas involves the use of different kinds of waste to uh, utilize its potential to the maximum. So for the uh, areas where we can collectively and efficiently use the human waste, we are planning to use, like we have quantified uh, four sources for biogas generation. So we'll install the uh, type of biogas depending on the potential of the sources that is also based on the availability and area in which it has the best potential. So we'll go by that approach to collect the uh, waste. Thank you. And then the second question is about, um, about the really high losses uh, in the more urban areas or closer to the power plants, the terribly high uh, transmission and distribution losses. I was wondering if you thought about or did any sensitivity about money that you could spend on reducing those losses versus the same amount of money of building new installations like the biogas generators and I'm talking about the urban areas closer to the power plants is there you know is there sometimes could it be cheaper to fix the transmission losses than it is to build something new to have you know generate more electricity Yes, so uh, actually, we in in our in our main presentation, we did recommend that government should work on uh, energy audits and work on the energy efficiency part as well. Uh, and 
as far as high transmission and distribution losses are concerned that's th those are mostly arising because uh, the government is not able to collect uh, revenue properly from the ghanian population as a result of which the there is a deficit to the uh, to the electricity operators so th that is some that is one part which the government will have to fix by bringing about some policy changes uh, and uh, as far as building biogas generators versus optimizing on the transmission and distribution losses is concerned biogas generators are meant only for, uh, for for fulfilling the uh, the uh, the cooking fuel crisis so both are very different things from our perspective okay thank you okay joe bob any questions yeah carl if i if i could i have two very quick questions first guys um very interesting mention of floating uh pv solar uh does that technology exist at scale? And if so, did you look at the operations and maintenance costs for floating solar versus fixed solar and what impact that might have on the, on the feasibility of this project? Uh, yes, so uh, floating PV megawatt or gigawatt projects are already in operation in different parts of the world. And we also have similar projects in India. While in terms of the cost benefit analysis, floating PV at present is 20% expensive compared to land based. But in our proposed solution, we are installing the solar uh, floating PV on the dams, which already have on the hydro dams, which are, already have uh, infrastructure in the country. So we will be utilizing the transmission system of those uh, dams, which is already there. So we will be offsetting the cost of uh, installing installing the new transmission line with these floating PV and that how we will be able to have the cost parity for the floating PV installations that we are proposing. Makes sense. Makes sense. My, my, my other question, opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, first of all, great job identifying LPG as part of the solution here and as part of the permanent solution, as part of something that actually has phenomenal uh, human benefits as well as cost benefits. Um, my, my question around LPG is, did you do much work on the sourcing of LPG uh, and, and the, the investment required to actually bring LPG molecules uh, to the distribution networks and, and, and where would that gas come from? So uh, Ghana is uh, blessed with some good amount of uh, gas resources. In fact, uh, current estimates, uh, whatever resources that they have that has been discovered so far, it is predicted that their current gas resources will last at least 25 to 30 years from now. So as far as availability of resources is concerned, that's not an issue. As far as uh, distribution of uh, LPG is concerned to the local population, that's where Ghana needs to, or the Ghanaian government needs to work a bit, because at this point of time, the Ghanaian household sometimes have has to wait for quite some time before they get their cylinder, cylinders refilled. So that's definitely an issue. So what we proposed or uh, one of the ideas that we thought, which is very frequently followed in our country, that is India, is that they can have a, a delivery system of cylinders. So at this point of time, Ghanaian population has to get into the lines outside the refilling station. And that, that's also a, a huge cost, you know, in terms of uh, productivity loss. So uh, what's, what, what's being done in India is what we will also propose for Ghana uh, to have a home delivery system. That's obviously going to cost some amount of money, but uh, th that's why we have the, uh, the uh, facility of, or the luxury of selling carbon credits and offsetting that cost with the revenue that is generated by selling the credits. Okay, we still have a little bit of time if there's any more questions. Well, I actually just had a curiosity question. Again, it's about um, biogas in the in the uh, agricultural areas, the vast agricultural areas. Um, uh, the biogas was going to be the major amount of biogas generation compared to urban areas. And so I was just curious, where does field crop residue go now? Is it usually just left on the fields and then allowed to be uh, nourishing the next year's crop or perhaps it's burned in the ashes nourished? So if you collect agriculture or feed animals, if you collect all the uh, agricultural waste and send it away, is there any downside or negative for how it used to be used or how it's currently being used? It's a curiosity question. Uh, all right. So, 
one thing that could be always done with any agricultural waste that is that is that is uh, you know just could which could not be utilized is that we, it can be used to convert it into agricultural manure so uh, that's very frequently being done in countries like india in myanmar in nepal in pakistan so what they basically do is that they uh, use these agricultural waste they then use earthworms and basically they leave it in the di in in they leave it uh, uh, they leave it for some time and then it results into manure which is uh, which is very beneficial so at this point of time dhana uses uh, chemical fertilizers and that is also not good in the long run so in a way the, this waste could be used for generating manures and they can go for organic farming which is a very uh, you know uh, which is an which is an upcoming market and that's also going to be a kind of new revenue stream for the ghanian population thank you all right thank you very much uh, i'd like to also thank all the teams you did a remarkable job staying within your 3 minute uh, time allotment for your presentations so uh, uh, congratulations on that um So at this point, we'll just move on. And uh, SJ and I are going to join the judges in the breakout room to tabulate the final scores. And while we do that, you'll have the opportunity to hear from some of our student interns and volunteers about their experiences working with the Switch Energy Alliance. Um, this discussion is going to be moderated by our executive director, Karina Smith, and our curriculum and product lead, Megan Morgan. Uh, let me open up the breakout room. And judges, can you see the breakout room? I think they may have left for the breakout room, Carl. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Karina. I'll let you take it from here. Okay. Thanks, Carl. Thanks. Hi, everyone, and congratulations. Your presentations are incredibly impressive. Um, I'd like to introduce three important people that are currently on this call. The first is Talha, Syed Talha Termizi. Hi, Talha. <laughs> Hi, Karina. <laughs> and the you. second is Anurag Bhattacharya. And the third is Ayush. Ayush, you, um, I'm so happy to see you. Uh, Kumar Jha, excuse me, I wanted to get your full name. So Talha, Anurag, and Ayush are very special to Switch Energy Alliance. Talha was an intern with us uh, two years ago and he is currently a volunteer. And the reason he changed from an intern to volunteer is because he moved here to Austin, Texas and has, is working on his um, higher med, um, uh, his um, master's at UT and has been doing some wonderful research. So um, I'd like to ask Talha, Anurag and Ayush. Anurag and Ayush, by the way, I don't know if uh, all of you know this, but they are from our winning team team number one winners last year in our 2021 case competition from team Unar Definity. Is that how you say it? <laughs> um, so they have been impressive and have been sitting in this very seats you're sitting in now. And Ayush and Anurag have been helping us organize this entire competition for each of you. So something I want to share with you is that um, out of all of you, you are our finalists this year. We're so proud of you. You're so smart and you're just so um, persistent and participating in this, we would uh, like to invite you to apply to an internship with us for next year. So what I thought I'd do is ask for Anurag, Ayush, and Talha to share with us their experience in being interns with us. Um, Talha, why don't we start with you? Uh, would you like to share maybe a highlight of, of being an intern at Switch and your experience working with us? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Karina, for a wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak, because this is a topic which I really like to speak to other students about, because my journey with Switch Energy Alliance is not like, it's, it's been for like three years now, because we stopped back in 2020 when the world was facing the unprecedented challenge of COVID-19 pandemic we launched the first international switch energy case competition so it was truly amazing to see how much the students care about this topic of energy poverty and our mission because almost 1000 students participated in that year from all six inhabited co continents it's been three years now and it is amazing to see the level of participation in the case competition and being an intern uh like I, I would say like interns play a a big role in, in in organizing the case competition from doing the plannings for months to formulate and organize the international competition from deciding the topic of the case from to organize helping to organize the finals of the case competition like in uh in being an intern it's like a journey it's like uh, it's 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 the work that we do towards a common shared goal. Yeah. So 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 being an intern of Switch Energy Alliance, it really opens doors to the endless opportunities. We get to work yeah. in a team comprising of multiple nationalities. I got the opportunity to speak at the opening ceremony of international uh, 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 a meeting for applied geoscience and energy in 2022, in which I also shared about my story of energy poverty. So, so it, it also makes a valuable addition to the resume. But most importantly, being an intern, you get a chance to work with highly talented and compassionate team of Switch Energy Alliance, and you really get to learn a lot. And most importantly, you get a chance to serve humanity. So this is very important. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Taha. Thank you. That's wow. Thank you for that wonderful insight. I really appreciate you um, being so connected with us. We just love working with you. Um, Anurag and Ayush, you are valuable members of our team now as interns for this year's case competition. You've done a phenomenal job working with Carl and Aiden and our team. And I just want to say thank you so much for everything. Um, would you like to share each of you maybe one highlight of being an intern at Switch Energy Alliance? Um, I'll go first. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Anurag, and I'm one of the case competition interns this year. Uh, I hope you're, uh, you're having a pleasant evening or morning, depending on where you are in the world. And I'm very excited to see the people who have fought their way through two difficult rounds of screening and have emerged as finalists. A uh, big high five to all of you. Congratulations on such a great achievement. And it's my proud privilege to be here as a member of the team that designed this year's case competition. It has been an amazing journey and one that I will cherish for a long time to come. Uh, I was part of the team that won the case competition last year along with Ayush here. And I want to tell all the finalist teams, I know what you're feeling right now. My best wishes to you for the results. You should be proud of the splendid job you've done. Uh, to all the teams that have participated in the case competition this year, I applaud your efforts, no matter how far you made it through the stages. Your campaign in the case competition had a positive impact on our society, and we hope you take the mission of Switch Energy Alliance forward and do your part in creating an energy-educated world. Uh, participating in the case competition last year was a very rewarding journey. Interning here at SCA was even more so. I'm grateful for the opportunities and exposure I got through the internship this year. I got to interact with people around the world and this was an unprecedented learning opportunity for me. The internet internship provided me with invaluable insight into the energy poverty and workings of the energy industry around the world. And Switch Energy Alliance helped me interact with and learn from leading energy industry uh, professionals. And uh, for me, Switch had a great impact both personally and professionally. And I hope this organization keeps positively influencing students around the globe and our society at large, a huge token of thanks to the entire Switch Energy Alliance team. Thank you and all the best. <laughs> Thank you, Anurag. Thank you. Ayush, do you want to share any highlights uh, from working with us this year? Yeah, yeah, sure, Karina. Thank you for that. Uh, it feels amazing to be here on like, like this coveted stage as a case competition intern. Uh, 
I was part of the of, of the team that won the case competition last year, and I am the part of the team that designed this year case competition. So I convey my best wishes to all the team that that participated this year and extend my heartfelt thanks to the volunteers who have so graciously agreed uh, to aid our endeavor. So my name is Ayush Kumar Jha, and I am a pre-final year applied geophysics undergraduate at uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Indian School of Mines and Bath. And currently, I'm the uh, like I, I'm a, I'm a case competition intern here at uh, Search Energy Alliance. So it has been a highly uh, enriching experience working at SEA, like both professionally and personally. Uh, I, I have been able to learn a lot about the energy industry, and it has helped me ex uh, explore a lot of other fields. Like I mean, beyond my university curriculum. I'm 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 grateful for this opportunity, and I believe it led to a huge transformation in my understanding of how the energy dynamic throughout the world works. And I would like to thank all my mentors and colleagues here at SEA for being supportive and kind and allowing me to expand my horizons and pursue my interests under their watchful tutelage. Uh, so in the end, I want to congratulate every team that embarked on their international search energy case competition journey for putting their best foot uh, forward and doing their part for understanding and eventually eradicating energy poverty. So that's all from my side. Thank you once again. Yeah. Thank you, Ayush. Thank you so much. Well, we will be sending an email out to all of you as finalists are all um, going to be invited to apply for an internship for uh, running next year's competition. So look out from, uh, for that email from us. I'd also like to introduce you to a few of our team members. We have um, Megan Morgan here. She is our lead curriculum uh, our, and product lead. We have Aidan Chadwick, our program associate. Um, Sarah Jane, who's over in the judging uh, room right now, and of course our chairman, Dr. Scott Tinker, is here with us this morning as well. Um, Megan, just to open it up to you, do you have any questions for any team members or for our interns at all that you want to ask? No, no pressure if not. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello to everyone. Wonderful to see you and congratulations to all of the teams. Uh, a question for the interns is what word of encouragement would you give all the participants as they've now done this huge body of work, they've collaborated, they've interacted with mentors and now judges, um, and they're continuing on in their education. Is there one encouragement you can give them to continue on um, in this work? Talha, would you like to go first? <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, so I would really uh, like highly recommend the students to 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 to, uh, to continue their efforts because energy poverty is is a story of, of one third of the global population almost. So so not, uh, just participate uh, like they did a very good job in participating in the case competition. I would highly recommend them to apply for the internship in SEA so that they can carry their work forward and help contribute to the humanity. It looks like our team leader, Carl Stephenson, and our judges are back. So uh, we just had a great discussion with our interns, Carl, but I don't want to keep our team members that are anxiously awaiting results. I don't want to make them wait any longer. So I'll let you take over, Carl. All right. Thanks very much, Karina. And uh, thanks to uh, our presenters there, Anurag, Ayush, and, and Talha. Julie Perez is also an intern. Unfortunately, uh, she had some academic obligations this morning and wasn't able to join us, but she's, uh, she's also been extremely helpful. So um, let's move on. We've got some exciting news uh, to present here shortly, but just to follow up um, with regards to the internship, we wanted to share that information with you because uh, in addition to the prize money, all of the finalist uh, participants will have the opportunity to apply for an internship with SWITCH and to help grow and improve our case competition and our other educational projects. So I'll be sending out an email uh, probably within the next week with more information and a link to the application form uh, so that you can apply for that. So before we uh, announce the final winners of the case competition, I did want to announce the results of our social media contest. And this was a new element that was added to the case competition this year and was actually proposed and managed by our interns Anurag Bhattacharya and Ayush Jha. So uh, I'd like to commend those guys for doing a great job. We had excellent participation 
And uh, I just hope that everyone had fun with it. So uh, the winners from the preliminary round is team 172, Sustaina from India. The winners from the semifinal round, team 184, team Surya, also from India. And here for the final round, the winners, team 102, AFC Legends from Colombia. So I'd like to congratulate these three teams and uh, each of them will, will uh, receive $100 for their social media efforts. And now I'd just like to uh, take a little bit of time, say a few words from, from uh, to the teams and the volunteers. And this is my first year running the case competition. And it's really been an honor to have interacted with all of you. Uh, I've been extremely impressed with the hard work, creativity, and the energy that all of the teams have put into their proposals. And I hope that you've all learned a lot from this experience and that you'll go forward with an increased awareness of the complexities involved in balancing energy poverty with environmental stewardship and economic and societal issues. Um, even if you didn't make it to the semifinal or final rounds, I hope that this was a positive experience and I hope that you'll um, uh, register to compete in the competition again next year. To all of the volunteer judges and mentors, many of whom are with us on the call today, I'd like to thank you very much for being so generous with your time and your expertise. Every year we recognize the fact more and more that this competition would not be possible without the participation and the de dedication of people like yourselves. And of course, a big thanks to our finalist judges uh, who joined us today. And Additionally, uh, we can't forget to extend a huge thank you to our sponsors, SEMPRA and the uh, Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at UT, and in particular to Dr. Hugh Daigle, who uh, hosted our panel discussion last month. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, our interns and volunteers for supporting me personally with their experience and creativity. It's really uh, helped a lot certainly brought me far along the curve uh, with respect to what's involved in running a competition like this. And I'd also like to recognize my colleagues, Aidan Chadwick, for his help in tracking all the project progress as we went along uh, over the last couple of months and posting the case competition information on social media. And I'd like to thank SJ for championing all the mass emailings that went out and of course our colleagues at ADG for their help with uh, the website support. So with that, let's announce the results of the case competition finals. In fifth place, team 194, Urja Vridi. In fourth place, team 160, Polaris Consulting. In third place, team 186, The Catalysts. In second place, Team 102, AFC Legends. And in first place, Team 184, Nimbus 2.0. Congratulations to all of the finalist teams. This has really been an extremely exciting competition. Um, you know, the mission of Switch Energy Alliance is to inspire an energy-educated future. And a large part of that effort is the development of potential solutions, which is what this competition is all about. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Scott Tinker to say a few words. He's on the call and I think it would be great uh, for everyone to hear from him. Wow, terrific. I just, uh, I'm sitting here so proud of everybody on this call. Of course, Carl just thanked a lot of key people, the folks who sponsor this uh, for sure and our volunteers and thank you celebrity judges. <laughs> you did a terrific job. I love the questions and I love the way students, you answered those so thoughtfully. Um, the, the SEA staff is vital to making this happen, but let me get to, to this. And Carl, <laughs> thank you for your first year. Uh, you killed it. You know, it's, uh, Thanks. it's a big job and we're so thankful that you're here and, and have volunteered to work for another hundred years for us, Carl. So that's good. It's <laughs> anyway, Students from around the world, and I know it's all different times and people will watch this later, but I hope, my hope is that as you struggled through this hard problem, you know, this very real problem of looking at a country that you chose from a selection of three and how do you really make this happen? How do you, how do you lift 
a nation from energy poverty up towards energy prosperity. It's not easy, is it? Um, you have to look at so many things, the resources and the available money, uh, the government system, the education levels, uh, what the environment is. What, it prevent, what, it, what does it present to you? What are your real options? And this is the great challenge we face as we try to bring the world out of energy poverty into energy and economic prosperity. I've said many times, my goal is net zero poverty. If we can accomplish that in the world, true affordable, reliable energy access for everyone, it will change the world, uh, pure and simple. So I look at you all as emissaries now. You know, congratulations for sure to the winners of the competition. All five of you did a remarkable job. I'm sure the judges had a terribly difficult time in the, in the judging room. But even beyond that, the hundreds and hundreds of students who took your time and thought about this, uh, I think it's going to change the way you think about the world. And I think it's going to help you to become a global citizen in a way that you might not have before. And we're here for that. We'll engage with you as you begin to think about how to do that and learn. Our interns who spoke to you just a few years ago were you. Uh, they weren't living in Austin, Texas, studying a master's degree on a stage in front of a thousand people like Talha was. They weren't saying remarkable kinds of things that uh, Anurag and Ayush just said to you about, about their experiences. They are you. And Let's do that. Let's kind of tear down these terrible barriers that seem to exist in, in some line, times in the online world of, of uh, shaming and these good and bad, clean and dirty solutions. It's not that, it's not simple. You know that. You knew that before, but you really understand that now. So I'm gonna ask each of you, all the students who participated in this year's international case competition to become global citizens and help the other students that you engage with throughout your early careers in your life to broaden the way they think, to really think about the global citizen and the global problem. And, you know, help us to inspire an energy educated future. It's our mission and you're part of our mission now. So thank you for what you've done and congratulations to everyone. All right, thanks very much, Scott. And just take a look at these one more time. Mm -hmm. And again, I'd like to uh, I'd like to congratulate everybody um, and thank all of the participants and the volunteers. And we certainly look forward to seeing you all again next year. Um, we will be sending out a survey to get your feedback on the best ways to improve the competition. So. Please do take the time to fill out the survey because it really provides us with the best information to keep the competition enjoyable and relevant. So with that, uh, once again, congratulations to everybody, both our social media winners, as well as our, our finalists and, and uh, the competition itself. And I'd like to thank everyone for their participation and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now. <laughs>